Welcome to MLOps Live, a podcast by Neptune AI. We host in-depth discussions where machine learning practitioners answer questions from other practitioners about one subject related to production machine learning and MLOps. Tune in to get real-life stories, dirty hacks, and pragmatic workarounds from ML people in the trenches. Welcome to another episode of MLOps Live. I'm your host for this episode, Stephen Oladele. Without my co-host Sabine today, well, she'll be back for the next episode. In this episode, we're going to be talking about continuous MLOps pipelines with Itai. Itai is currently the current software team lead at Supervise, which is an ML observability platform for high-scale production ML workloads. He's also been a software engineer and data engineer at mid-scale to like hyper-scale startups doing really incredible stuff in the software and computing industries. If I did I miss anything? Hey guys, nice to be here. Yeah, I think we're good. Okay, perfect, perfect, awesome. So we're going to be digging into the, the weeds of continuous ML ops pipelines, especially with uh, each experience there. So before we go on to the episode, a few housekeeping rules again. So if you're listening to us live, uh, and you're currently on Zoom right now, please leave your questions in the chat or you can you know, raise your hand somewhere and then we'll unmute you to ask your question. Uh, if you're listening live on LinkedIn or wherever you're listening from, please drop your questions in the chat box and then we'll do well to get them to each other during the course of the episode. So without further ado, I think we can dive right into the episode. So welcome again, Ichai. Thanks. Let's do it. Yeah, awesome. Right. Before we start to give really good context to the entire episode, right? We usually have this one minute, explain stuff in one minute. So in your case, in one minute, can you sort of explain the business advantages of automating an ML stack? Because, you know, that's like the foundation of what we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I think in general, I'll split it into two sections, right? There's the operational section and the business section. In the operational section, continuous ML stack is usually supposed to give your data scientist as much time or, or your, your entire data team as much time as possible to innovate and to bring a new solution to the table that will help generate some business value, okay? Whether it's an indirect business value like customer satisfaction or actual direct revenue from, I don't know, conversion rate and so on. So having a robust infrastructure within place will make their life a bit easier in debugging and making sure that everything runs smoothly uh, while giving them more time to actually develop stuff and conduct the value. Now, the second one is the actual business value. And there has been many use cases in the recent, in the last years where companies have implemented machine learning based solutions and deployed it and very fast and sometimes too slow, they realize that their models are misbehaving. And sometimes the person that is actually discovering that the model is misbehaving is the someone in the business analyst team where he realizes that, oh my God, we have approved loan for people that we shouldn't, or we recommended movies to someone that will never click it and so on. And this usually happens when the processes of deployment and training serving pipelines are manual or semi-manual, and then mistakes can occur, right? Mm. So continuous yeah. ML stack usually draw, tries to bring this down to zero. Awesome. Awesome. So, so this is well over one minute. Well, I think we'll take it because it sets uh, the tone for the rest of the episode. So right yeah. before we dive into some of the premeditated questions, as well as the community questions, again, you can leave your questions in the chat if you have them, and we definitely try to prioritize those uh, during the course of the episode. So I think you spoke about really the advantages there. And I thought we should sort of go into the considerations because I just want to understand from your perspective, why should teams really consider a continuous ML stack, like automating like a continuous ML pipeline, pretty much MLOps pipeline in quotes, because obviously, I don't know, maybe you can also give a context into what is an ML pipeline and how is that different from an MLOps pipeline in quote as well? Yes, of course. So I heard this phrase not long ago, it said that if you're struggling to deploy one model to production, then you're an ML engineer. And when you're struggling with deploying thousands, then you're an MLOps. And I think that's pretty much summarizes, like when you have your machine learning pipeline in place, it's extract the data from somewhere. It is cleaning it, do some, does some feature engineering on top of it, makes it preparing it for training. Then it trains it. 
evaluate your model on some validation data set and then make try to make a decision whether it's good enough for production or not this is a common ml pipeline now when enterprises or data teams are trying to scale this pipeline into hundreds or sometimes even thousands then some concepts might change and this is where you're trying to make sense of the logic you're trying to write the logic for those pipelines in a scalable way when you can reuse different components within this pipeline maybe change only the core the specific core logic for a specific use case or a specific model within that so i think in the general concept right if, when you're trying to scale to many many models then when this is where ml ops challenges comes into play and in actual ml ops pipelines are differ differs ml engineering pipelines or interesting i think the core takeaway there is um, sort of the skill and I, i'm going to like the the sort of logic side of things you mentioned I'm sort of thinking, what are the core components of the pipeline that you need to put in place when starting out building this stuff, right? What are some of those components you just think about at the at the very onset? So maybe before I answer, I'll, I'll give a little bit of context from like my experience, right. what I know. Mm -hmm. So in the ML ecosystem or in the ML teams in companies, we have two main sections. We have the research section where things are mainly happening on static data where you you know you have a feature store in place or maybe some databases and ETL right. processes running in the background giving you some sampling of the data and then some work is being done to make it, make sure that there's no nulls within the data and you do one hot encoding on some categorical features and you do many many manipulation on that data until you have your right. vectors in place for the training fast forward your model is ready and you can deploy it now we're moving to the second mm. stage or the second domain within that group which is the engineering i call it the engineering phase now there's right. a lot of symmetries <laughs> between the research and the engineering phase you still have right. your feature store and the extract data component you're still right. preparing it and do some feature engineering sometimes it's not yeah. the same you train a model sometimes in the research you'll try to train thousands of models using some research or other technologies in order to find the best solution and then you have your chosen model in the engineering phase and you need to make sure that it's good enough or better than the one that is right now in production so right. you need to come up with good bench KPIs and benchmarks to make sure that these two can be transferred and then you move to deployment strategies where you can do some shadow deployment and in the first mm -hmm. model will get all the traffic but yeah. the other one will predict and then you can compare many other strategies ab testing and so on eventually you will actually deploy it to this endpoint and start to observe or monitor the behavior of it now as i said there are many symmetries and there are some new components coming into play in the engineering part and those when you're implementing your pipelines you need to take that into account because you want to reuse as much code as possible. That's something that I would point out. Awesome. So I'm thinking from all these things you've said, right? This is like a really hard, a really complex thing to do. And sort of thinking it's like maybe for hyperscale companies. So now this sort of brings me to this question of when should teams start considering building that continuous ML, their ML stack or automating their ML stack? Is it at the very start when they are thinking about the problem or are there levels to this stuff? Majority um, levels, I mean. <laughs> So there are levels to it. I think the first time I came across the maturity levels of ML engineering platforms is on a Google paper from four or five years ago, I think. They divided into three maturity levels. Now you have the manual, the level zero, they called it, where everything is super manual. There is a complete separation between the data science team and the ML engineering or the data team. And when the pickle, the serialized object of the model is ready, you go on Slack or you actually knock on someone's office and ask them, hey, I got a pickle for you. Here's the disk. And not, not really, but, you know, they, they pass it manually between each other. And then there's someone responsible for deploying it to an endpoint or using it on a cloud function. I think moment of truth. It was me five years ago. Yeah. And um, this is maybe what got me into this MLOps domain that I really fa felt the pain. And then Google said, okay, so there is the level one where pipeline are being introduced, but there is no continuous training and no continuous training so far. You do have some CI CD in place. So when the model is ready, it's being tested and you can deploy it using like take the pickle object, put it somewhere 
on the cloud and pass it on to some new training serving pipeline that will read it and do all the rest for you. But there's still a lot of separation. And the last level, and to be honest, I'm meeting many companies these days and I'm trying to figure out how they're utilizing their ML infrastructure. And I can say that while most of them want to be in the level two, it is getting quite complex to implement this entire thing because, you know, you add more level of continuous training and you need to make your feature store very fresh. Your data is supposed to be very fresh. So for example, if you're trying to retrain your model on data from today, most of the companies, they don't have the data ready for training. They have it like from last night or so on, because the data ETLs are running every on a cron level base every day on 4 a.m. in the morning. So this is like the last level of having everything super intuitive and super fast that you can just decide or not even you, something within your pipeline can decide that things are going bad and all of a sudden a new training pipeline will come up and do it for you. And sometimes retraining is not the solution. It goes into a lot of complexities. So maybe this is like the level three, the level two or level three for those maturity levels in organizations. Right. So teams that are starting out at level one, how do you think they can move up that chain itself? Are there like, you know, specific triggers in terms of maybe there's a scalability problem or other triggers that you've seen that will help them or that will incentivize them sort of to move up to, up one level or not? Yeah. That's a very good question. I think sometimes there's someone has to make this decision of moving from a manual process into something more complex infrastructure wise. And it's not an easy decision to make because you need a lot of resources to move from level zero to level one. From level one to level two, you know, it, it's an ongoing process that you have multiple owners that will push it to it, to, towards this goal. But from zero to one, you need a completely new set of skills. You need someone that has DevOps background within your team, which most data teams don't have. You will need to dive into new technologies, a completely new domain, because right now it's not only using Python libraries. Okay, it's not that I'm trying to say that data science by itself is not a complex thing, but you know that the actual algorithm code is just a fraction of the entire infrastructure. And you need configuration files and maybe Kubernetes and some workflow managers, and you need metadata stores and new DBs, and you need everything to be on a low latency. And it's getting very complex. So I don't know, maybe my first tip for doing so is when you feel like you're struggling to innovate within your data science team, maybe go and try sell, like shelf solutions, vanilla products. I wouldn't call it vanilla, but you can use the big cloud vendors, AI platforms. They're amazing for you know a fast POC just to make sense of things and demonstrate the value. And once you will see the value there, then it will be much easier to convince whether your managers or the C-level people to actually allocate the necessary resources. Right. And I think you, you you mentioned something about the need. You need this, you need that, you need, and that's quite a lot of you needs in there. And <laughs> I, I was just sort of wondering, because you work at Supervise right now, and then I know you've worked with a lot of teams in really understanding this concept of building that continuous pipeline in quote there. So I'm sort of thinking, where do you think teams often get it wrong when building continuous ML pipelines or MLOps pipelines? Wow. It's interesting. What do they get wrong? I don't know. Maybe starting way too complex. I think that data science, as I said, is a complex topic. And then you tend to over-engineer solutions. This is maybe something to bear in mind when you're trying to deploy your first model with a continuous ML stack. Okay, we call it a continuous ML stack, but maybe for the deployment, it's not even a stack. It's a combination of two open source tools that you just need to describe the logic using code and try to bring it to some endpoint or have your Lambda function or serverless function use it eventually. So maybe this is the first thing to keep things simple and always keep that in mind as you move forward. And as you talked about complexity, let's dive into your, your experience. What is like the most basic solution you've seen, like on the engineered solution you see it for building ML pipelines? So. I think the most simple way 
And I, I'm sorry if I'll mention some technologies during that, but um, I just, you're experimenting with multiple technologies or maybe workflow orchestration and so on. And sometimes some of them are exciting more than others. I'm sorry if I'm biasing someone, but I recently played a bit with Flight. It's a workflow orchestration tool. And I think the most simple training serving pipeline that I managed to see is something that we actually build within Supervise. Because basically, what are we doing? What is our product? We're observing machine learning models in production. Now, in order to do that very well, we need to understand use cases. So we're building, we're constantly building solutions to the most simple problems. Sometimes we're using data sets from Kaggle just in order to train a model on it, try to feel how the flow is working, and then put it in some endpoint and let someone play with it and send some HTTP request and see if it's responding within a scale or a, late, a good latency and so on. I played around with Flight and I found many cool features that it had. And, you know, I just took a simple Diamonds data set without even having some fancy feature store, store in place and so on. My component of extracting data was just go use Pandas and read it from the web and then filter it. I When we did it, we tried to show, to demonstrate how to discover drift in your production data. So we just read this data set. We filtered out all the diamonds that their price is exceeding 10,000 USDs. And then we ran all the rest of it. So it was a very simple validation step. We pretty much took all the co complicated concepts of data science and we reduced them to the most simple way. Even our cross-validation was on two folds. So you're pretty much doing your cross-validation on 50% of your data twice. It doesn't really make any sense to do it, but we did just in order to fill it and, you know, to play around with the technology. When eventually we had some endpoint that we wrote using Flask, just a simple Python framework, and we deployed it to that endpoint. And from that point on, it was exposed out to the world and everyone could use it. And it was the first time that we showed that in less than two hours, you can come up with a simple continuous, very simple continuous ML training serving pipeline. And I think many people that were with us in the room, then some coin dropped and they, they realized that it's complex only when you make it complex. You can bring solutions in a matter of days when you're focusing on the essence and the essentials part of it and not on the ego boost that it will give you in your GitHub page, right? So maybe... I don't know. That's the most simple example I could off my head give you. And on the other side of the spectrum, have you found overkill solutions? Maybe you could give examples. Maybe like there was this, this basic problem and then someone used this gigantic technology to sort of build an email pipeline of it. Any examples? Um, for the actual big ones? Yeah, like overkill. Um, really. Yeah, it, it's top secret. No, but I've seen some companies, and you know what? Maybe there's also some differentiation to do here. Some companies are using ML not for their main product, right? It's very good for charm predict predictions, and sometimes it's very good for um, better engagement and understanding some business KPIs. Usually these companies will invest in ML, but it, they will invest it on a later stage within their life cycle. Probably it's obvious, I guess, why. The second type of companies are the one that their main work, main product uses AI and ML. And this is where you see like the most exciting solutions where latency is an issue when you need to be like sub 10 milliseconds for prediction. And you know, you have edge devices and you need to make uh, the training as continual or, or as fresh and fast as possible. And you see the evaluation step, just to be clear, the evaluation step is usually the most complex step within the pipeline, because what you're basically doing is you're taking your precious trained model and you're running it on a validation data set. And this validation data set when validation is really an interest, and it is sometimes, I can give you lots of examples, you need to make it as confusing as possible for your ML models. And this usually means that it will be large. It will have many different correlations within features. It will make your computer or your VM 
work hard. Of course, deploying endpoints with deployment strategies. So I have seen some companies in the fraud detection ecosystem and uh, some within security offices, I, I, I'd say they're very accurate in writing these software components because they're missing something here can cost millions to the company or even li like human being like lives. And this is where, you know, you get to see a very exciting ML stack in place. I don't know if, when I see stuff like that, I'm, I'm getting very excited. So yeah, <laughs> this, I guess from like, a, as an example. Awesome. Awesome. But maybe you could, I don't know if you've had situations where maybe like it was a, I'm just trying to allude to the fact that maybe they have a simple problem, right? But then the technology they use to solve that problem shouldn't be what they use. They should have used something basic. Have you sort of found situations like that? And you know, how can teams sort of tackle that decision making side? Yeah. So I think when you go first, like when you're coming from an engineering background and you do your first few steps in the MLOps domain, then it's sort of overwhelming in the beginning because there are many, many, many stalls in a conference and everyone is doing the state of the art technology. And how do I assemble? something from all that. And again, in our core, we're engineers and we, we like, and sometimes we're focusing on the challenge more than we're focusing on the value that it brings or on the impact. And I think it's a good thing to have, but this is where you're like the, the team leading, the team leaders supposed to come and play. And I would say when you feel like you're not wasting time, but let's come up with a benchmark. If you see that you're focused, if you have a model and you waste more than a sprint or two to three weeks of work and you have no results, like there's actually no value, it means that you're over-engineering it. This is where I will stop and I'll just completely revert and I'll go and try the big cloud vendors that I mentioned before, just right. as a proof of concept, proof of value, I would say to make sense and to see if it's actually working, if we can actually get some value from it. If we do, everything will be way easier because the concepts will be a bit more familiar right now. Much of the infrastructure has been, or, or the actual functionality that you need has been introduced to you, whether it was, was from an SDK APIs or from the GUI, the actual web interface. And I think it will make sense just to differentiate between the different tools and components in order to actually assemble a real valuable solution fast. I think, I hope that answers your question. But yeah, that, that clarifies yeah. it. That clarifies yeah. it. Thank you so much for sharing. So again, if you're in the audience, if you have any question, please leave your question in the chat, whether it's on LinkedIn or here in Zoom, or you know, raise your hands to, and then we'll sort of unmute you. So we're going to be jumping right into community questions straight up. The first question here, What's your take on designing pipelines with many models, each with their own environments? How do I go about it? Yeah, so I think in a way we, I mentioned it before, so let's try to make it a bit more accurate. I think first and foremost, you need to understand the relationships between the different solutions and try to group them together. If you have 10,000 models on a completely different ETLs, they probably don't have much in common. And when you're trying to run a clustering algorithm on them, but when you're trying to group them together and make sense of what correlates to what, then you can start and extract the logic that can be reused. And when you're extracting the logic, so you will have, I think, few multiple extracting data steps. Some will come from in-memory DBs and some will come from a pure SQL server and some will come from like some blob storage. But basically the code will be written once. You will have your packages in place. You'll be able to understand what's common. And that's maybe something that has a lot to do with like traditional software engineering. When you're, you're trying to make every function as coherent or as accurate as possible to its purpose. So when you have a lot of models and you're trying to build a lot of pipelines, Try to find the common logic, implement it first, and then see how you tailor made new logics for each and every single model. Using object oriented programming will help a lot in this. I never recommend writing scripts unless you have serious memory issue, but object oriented programming will help here, especially using some Python packages like Twine and Poetry, for example, just to pack 
package some SDKs or some functionality together and have them install the different Docker images, then use them. And in terms of the environment type, you know, where, for example, you're dealing with these ML pipelines and like the production environment, maybe the staging environment and dev environment. So how do you sort of move those across environments? I'm thinking of this situation whereby you have to handle a lot of things like the metadata from the pipeline and the credentials and stuff like that. So I think separation is essential here. So, okay, back to the two different domains. We have the research phase and we have the engineering phase. In the engineering phase, I don't see any uh, justification or any good value of having shared resources between staging, development, and production environment. It's never a good thing to mix those, not in the credentials level, not in the database sections, and not on the Kubernetes or any cluster or technology that you're using. In the research area, I would say that some thought should be put into this. And I think it's use case related. And sometimes you will need tools like Neptune that will help you share some information in between the research phase and the production phase. For example, you're trying to evaluate the model in production, but you need somehow to understand what's the best RMSE or the record or some quality metric, performance metric that you have gathered within your experiments. So sharing those will be very helpful. I do tend to, like when I'm, I'm processing it right now, I think replicas are something that you should use and not necessarily have your production you speak to a research environment. It's not as scalish, it's not as available, and you don't want all your pipeline to crash just because of some YAML configuration that you missed. So YAML. Yeah, <laughs> well, what's your take on YAML for beauty pipelines? Should we avoid it in total? Or <laughs> this was no question, anyways. <laughs> for YAML? Yeah, for YAML. I love YAMLs. YAMLs are the best. Um, oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, no, I have no problem. With there, that. There's always this hate on YAML. I don't know why. <laughs> No, no, I am. I think YAMLs are awesome. <laughs> you know what? I'll give you a, an amazing example. And I'm sorry, I'm I'm going off topic right now, but there is this cool technology called Kafka Connect, right? And in a very high level, I'm not trying to sell you anything, but just in a high level, what it basically does, it says, okay, so you have Kafka. It's an amazing tool, amazing system. People are using it, but sometimes, I don't know, we don't know why, other tools and components will need to talk to Kafka. Now, Many, many companies, um, I think if I'll ask you how many companies, some, how many engineers wrote code for calculating mean average error or some common metric. I think this code has been written millions of times, but it's the same code. And so what Kafka Connect basically does is it gives you a very flexible YAML configurations where you can actually just define what's your source, where you're bringing the data from, and what's your sync, where you want to spill the data into. And then by a simple YAML file, it will just give you the best implementation possible for processing that actual data. You don't need to write code. It's a YAML file. So I think YAMLs are amazing. They're abstracting away some of our problems. I'm sorry I went off topic. Let's go back to MLOps. <laughs> yeah, this is, thanks for pointing that out. Back to the questions <laughs> anyways, community questions. So this person asked in community, MLOps community, how can I introduce continuous training to evaluate system improvement or degradation as a result of code changes? That's a good question. So I think there should be some logic written here, and this is where you really need an observability platform. Again, I'm not trying to sell you anything, but when your model is somewhere there out, out in the world, getting ongoing data profiles from whatever happening in our world, and all of a sudden it starts to get many missing values, for example, right? So there are, you can implement some logic that will recognize it and try to make sense of where this feature or information came from in case it will you can use uh, maybe Git API and understand if, you, if you're keeping your ETLs in Git, you will understand that this code has changed in the last 12 hours and make sense of it. But I guess... You should also implement some of the, this is where I think data validation and data testing comes into play. And you should really put some thought and effort into testing your code or your ML infrastructure. Again, the same like 
in this your traditional software. We need unit test and we need property-based test and performance test. But right now, and many other tests, but right now there is a new level of complexity because you need data validation to make sense of the distribution within the data that you're training on and also a model evaluation or model validation uh, step and many others. So I guess good testing will help you and also good observability platform that will recognize that your model is misbehaving and try to reason why. Yeah, right. Thanks for sharing that. So let's jump into the next question. And this person asks, what's your way of handling credentials, excluding things like GitHub secrets, it is a, you know, do you handle credentials for your ML pipeline or, you know, save everything as central vote? What's your best practice here? Yeah. So again, in production, usually I'm using secret managers of the cloud provider that I'm working on. I recently started using one password just, and it's also helps me with keeping like credentials that are not relevant for production needs and so on. And, but of course, like my specific GitHub token, for example, and so on. So this is useful as well, but for production purposes, for enterprise level work, I think use the cloud provider secret managers. They put a lot of work and emphasis on making them secure. Don't try to bring, come up with your own solutions because hackers these days or vulnerabilities are a thing. And you don't want to be the one to blame for some leakage. Right. That's fine. So we have a first question in the chat. So this person asks, in a scenario where the data is, you know, privacy sensitive, for example, healthcare data and stuff, or maybe like federated learning use cases, you know, what are the challenges of implementing like continuous MLOS pipelines or for such problems? Yeah, that's something that I encounter quite often. And that's, that is a thing, right? I think... Completely honest, I even struggled with a solution for someone today about it, I swear. So the most simple way, and some security researchers will disagree with me, is to have some encoding, decoding strategy, some encryption that you can just transform your feature, your specific private information to some garbage or some value, unvaluable data. Of course, you don't want your model to be fed with that transformation. And you also want to have some decoding that will be able to deserialize it back to the actual values. So for example, I don't know if you have a model that is using some, it was trained on your company's ARR, for example, and you don't want to share it with the world. And it's using, I don't know, HTTP request to some endpoint in the other side of the world for the prediction. Not that I say it happening a lot, but just as an example then you want to make sense that this ARR will go through some mathematical manipulation, arrive there, get the response, and then decode it back. So this is like the most simple way. There are some ways of having like an air gap and then your system, your entire infrastructure is within one place or on an edge device where it's close to network. And then you have other challenges of training and updating your model and so on. So I think it's Use case dependent, mostly. Um, yeah, I think this is mostly the strategies that I will take. Right. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the next community question. This person asks, what's the best way to build continuous data pipelines that prioritize good quality data? Is it part of the... I mean, I know for sure that the data side as well is really crucial for continuous ML of stack. Well, maybe you can... So maybe, you know, you need a team of... Um, Maybe try to rephrase it. I'm, I'm trying to come and I have like many, many <laughs> answers, but I'm trying to <laughs> right, see yeah. which one is the uh, best to the topic. Yeah. yeah. So basically the data pipelines, all right, the data in dash, or let's say the data pipelines as well. What is the best way to build and ensure that, you know, the continuously, the data is continuously validated and the quality is high for the production data quality is high for the rest of the downstream uh, services in the pipeline. Yeah. Okay, great. So that's a great challenge that many companies have these days for like actual continuous training. And I'll say there is the technology aspect here when you can use Apache Flink or other technologies that will help you stream and process the data during like as close to real time as possible. And then within your training pipeline, you will need very good logic to understand whether your model is good enough. I think there was an example for, I don't know if it was on 
Amazon or Ali, Alibaba, I think, when they, I think it was Alibaba, they actually bought Flink and they wanted to prepare for um, the 11th of November, I think, Bachelor Day or something, I, I forgot the name. And the reason was they just needed to keep retraining their model during that day many, many, many times. Now, it's a huge technological challenge because besides the huge scale that you're experiencing from people all over the world using your website, creating events, clicking on stuff, events are happening all the time. Each time that you want to redeploy a model and you want to make it as good as possible for that specific time and to take the most fresh data, then you will need something to process it, clean it, feature engineer it, put it into your training pipeline. And then also you're evaluating or your validation data set as close to the production data as possible, like as in the integrity level, not, not as close because then you're not testing anything, but just to sample the actual distribution in a good way. And I think that's like the actual, the biggest challenge maybe in real time inferencing and continuous ML stack. Great. Thanks for sharing that. So next question, this person asks, how would you typically evaluate orchestrators for building continuous ML pipelines or MLOps pipelines? Or do you have like recommendations and stuff? So yeah, flight is my first recommendation, but no, seriously, there are many, they risk, like with every new technology. And as we said before, we start out small, we read the documentation. All of them has a quick start guide where you can just install it locally, play around with it just to make sure that, you know, the GUI is very intuitive and the SDK is, and the community is very supportive and you have all the relevant code implemented for your use, sorry. And I think... I will try to define what's my scale and use case and data pipeline and how much processing I have to do. Do I need a GPU? Do I need only CPUs, multiprocessing or not? And so on. And then like on any alternative checks, you know, just try to make, you do this table where you put the things that you you care about the most, you give them the most weight, and then you just do it, just use a simple math function to come up with the best weighted solution. This solution, this orchestration solution is constantly evolving. Um, it's amazing to see new startup in, the, in this domain and many, many open source tools coming up every day and big companies are adopting these technologies. And they're also presenting and showing the webinars are very, there's many webinars in, in these topics. So I guess start small, try to read as much as possible about it. Look in GitHub in the open source world, find solutions and implementations, try to make sense of it, and then go with the solution. Nice, nice. Thanks for yeah. sharing that. No worries. Okay, this person asks, could you recommend a tool stack or you know your best practice for optimizing the training and development employment process, sorry, for MLOps pipelines? Yeah, of course. I will say something that I said, I think, a few times before, but I, I just want to keep that as bold as possible. When you start, if you're starting, the one, that, whoever asked this, if you are starting out now, go and try, I don't know, Google Vertex, Amazon SageMaker, Azure ML, and go into it slowly try to understand the different components. But my optimal solution, if you'll ask me, if you'll tell me tomorrow, hey, I go and build the most shiny ML infrastructure you can for this solution, I think I will use Neptune in the research area where I can just log the metadata and keep track of everything and try to make sense of it. And of course, CI, CD, use GitHub or GitLab or any other Git tool just to keep your code aligned. That's way like that's like it goes without saying i would also use bento ml for serving bento ml is an open source tool it's if people here use python and they are writing web application they're probably familiar with django or flask or fast api i'm a big fan of fast api i think it's amazing but for ml it lacks some support where i find it the most it's pitfall there like its challenge is when your model is needs consumes a lot of RAM, a lot of memory, then scaling using fast API is not very good because it will just duplicate across the workers your model. And if you need, I don't know, three gigabytes of RAM 
for specific assembling learning, assembler learner or neural network, then you're just copying it where Bento and you know what, there's also Seldon who they are amazing as well. They give you that flexibility of having one model and scaling horizontally using it. The training serving, uh, I think I said, would be Flight, maybe Kubeflow, Argo, these kind of tools. Again, depends on the need. Feature store, I don't know. I'm a big fan of Hop's work, but I recently heard about many new feature stores that I still haven't tried and tested, and I will, but I think Hop's work is amazing. Uh, what they did with the concept of feature store is amazing. The instrumentation of the actual entities within that domain are quite complex, and they managed to do it in a clear way. And... I don't know. That's it. If I need some storage, you know, you have all your cloud vendor storage solutions. It's easy. Right. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. So I think this particular question is very specific to Kubeflow pipelines. And this person asked, I'll be very interested in hearing your thoughts on how, you know, I can manage pipeline deployments to Kubeflow pipelines and how that process integrates with um, CICD pipelines. Any thoughts on that? Great. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. Kubeflow has a, a very cool feature in my eyes where you can use Kubeflow's compiler and then you just take the components, your like your actual function that you decorate with a task and you can serialize them into JSON. And then you can have your source code with the Python logic being kept for like the CI part where you're testing it, you're making sure that everything is robust enough to go into the actual pipeline and run it. And then eventually you also serialize it create a JSON out of it, and then you can assemble using JSONs like an actual complete workflow. So that's within the CI CD, I will just consider these two, this capability. Besides that, I think Kubeflow is very straightforward. It's pretty simple to use and just understand the entities and play around with the SDK, just read a little bit about it. I think also Google Vertex is using Kubeflow under the hood. So if you're interested in learning Kubeflow, just might as well go and play with Vertex a bit, see what it's generating. Maybe that's also a very simple getting started guide. Yeah, using Google. I uh, interesting. I used to think that Kubeflow pipelines was actually separated from Vertex AI. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Okay. I mean, uh, this is really related really question, and can you know, just let me know. This person asked. I've only started begun experimenting with um, Kubeflow. Do you have any resources or examples of CI/CD for Kubeflow pipelines? Maybe like, you know, deploying a new pipeline version to a cluster is in like Google Cloud Build or stuff like that. So I think, yeah, Google Cloud is my first go-to, I think, because they're using Kubeflow. So all the actual SDK is exposed over there and you can see examples and everything. But like, I, I don't I don't have a direct reference right now, but I think Towards Data Science has a lot of information about Kubeflow. I even wrote one myself. If you'll go and look, there is Kubeflow tutorial that I did to create a continuous SAML stack. But I think Kubeflow is getting a lot of traction and you will find online much information. So I'll say Google, Taurus Data Science, and eventually GitHub. Just go ahead and look for Kubeflow and see people's implementation. I think I also have an implementation on GitHub uh, <laughs> from about a year ago. So might as well check this out as well. And yeah, I think that's enough. It will be more than enough to dive into this technology and play around with it. Right, right. So we have a question here on Zoom. And this person, I'll just paraphrase the question anyways, but with the sort of like advanced tools and the MLOps tools are out there, lots of MLOps tools are out there, especially to that sort of promise to build this MLOps stack, right? It could get overwhelming. So what are the most foundational technologies that we should sort of learn to really keep ourselves on top of these tools, especially looking at building when building continuous ML stocks? Yeah, it's a very good question. So you know what? It's not even a technology rather than a just a paradigm or maybe a methodology, mm, right. right? So mm-hmm. most of this talk was about continuous ML workflows, orchestration platforms. So this is one right. technology. It's, what it basically means is how we can separate different processes into their own Docker process, Docker image, where they can run, do some functionality and get and go down. And then the next thing comes up, picks up where the last thing has stopped. And this is what's called DAG, a direct acidic graph, where Mm -hmm. you can just create a connection between those processes. This is one. You have where Neptune and MLflow and experiment tracking, this is the, the paradigm, the concept of experiment tracking comes into play. So this is also something to bear in mind. 
serving. So what serving really is, is taking your hard working, hard worked machine learning object, your train model object, and wrapping it with some interface to requests or to some cloud function that will be able to process it. So I said serving, I said orchestration, mm -hmm. I said experiment right. tracking, metadata stores, incredibly important, databases, of course, and observability, because you need to monitor, to keep monitor this thing. And I wouldn't say it enough, so uh, times, but people need, like, you need to remember it, observability, not because I work for supervised, but because model fails silently. Your entire data, your entire platform seems okay, the exit codes, are good, the status codes are good, the utilization is okay, but you're somehow approving loans to whoever requests for it. And this is where you're mi losing millions of dollars just because you forgot to retrain or you forgot some variable. So this is observability is important here. And just as a follow-up to that, you know, how do you sort of think about setting up retraining for your pipelines itself? Because I think people get to the point where they've served and eventually maybe somewhere there they get to the point where they monitor, then how can they ensure that, you know, what's your sort of process around setting up retraining the model and then, you know, continual learning sort of? Yeah, I think I waited for this question because the reason is I call it the shoemaker's son goes barefoot, right? Because we, all of us, we're data people. And when I come and meet data science teams and data engineering teams and ML engineering teams, I usually ask them, one of the first conversation, what's your retraining strategy? And I think 90% of the time I get seasonal, like frequency-based retraining. Now, let's just call it by its name. It's just someone is doing like this and it says, every week I'm going to retrain. Every 90 days I'm going to retrain. Now, obviously, it's not robust in any way, right? Because seasonality occurs because ongoing world is like the data is shifting no matter what you'll do and i'm just having some retraining in there because your etl arrives in i don't know every 90 days doesn't make sense and this is where most of the talk of monitoring strategies comes into play but i would consider maybe two or three strategies to observe your model right the first thing is distribution shifts you need to make sense of the different difference or the ground level movement in the distribution between your training data set and your production data that flows into your model. When you recognize such drift, you need to retrain and you don't just need to retrain for the sake of retraining, you need to sm retrain smartly. You need to understand why it happened. Do you need to separate into two different models? Do you need to recalibrate your data? Do you need to, I don't know, Go back to research phases. You need to understand the reason why this drift occurs and act accordingly. Second thing is integrity-based or missing values or most frequent value that, I don't know, for some reason exceeds its threshold and so on. That's also a retraining. Performance. And performance is quite hard because to calculate performance metrics, you need both the label, the ground truth, and the prediction value. And sometimes the label arrives way late. When you are able to retrieve this label in a fast enough manner, then calculating performance is very, very, very important. And it gives, I think, the best value because when you're, I think there was an example for it. I'm sorry if it takes too long to answer, but there was this example in Lyft, in a company in Lyft, where they had a model. I'm not sure. I read it somewhere. I'm not sure it's a real example, but imagine that you have your taxi services or driving services somewhere in this specific neighborhood on a Thursday night. It's usually quite empty and there's not many people. And because of that, there's not many orders, but somehow for a specific reason, yeah. in that specific day, there was a big party in that neighborhood and many people came there and many people need taxi. Now your model will usually use its performance will start to decrease. It will not send enough taxis to that area and then the rates will be higher and then people will be will wait longer for a taxi and it will cost you in revenue. They'll go to competitors and so on. Now, if you will be fast enough and you will monitor the performance metrics and you will be able to retrain and or maybe the distribution shift and you will be able to retrain it as fast as possible, you will be able to tackle this challenge 
and to make sure yeah. that everyone is happy with your application. So that's for observability. I have a lot of things to say. Yeah, because, yeah I, that's what I yeah, do. Yeah, there's <laughs> definitely a lot to get through. And unfortunately, we're out of time. But I think we can just take maybe just one more question in, like, in, in the next like 30 seconds or so. There's a question from the Zoom and this person asked, do you have any references for building domain-specific MLOps system architecture? I think O'Reilly's have a great book okay. about it. Look it up. Mm, uh, okay, yeah, designing ML systems. Yeah, right. exactly. Mm, okay, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, architecture is also a complex thing and there's no one solution fits all. You need to take into account many things. So I'm not, I don't think there is one clear solution. Mm. It's, it's a mixture of reading different, understanding different technologies within the domain and trying to assemble something out of them. Mm. But many, many, many blog posts are being written about designing ML infra infrastructure. And I want you to read about it. Go and read. <laughs> yeah. Like, like all of you guys. We have a blog post on the uh, NFT.ai blog on, you know, designing MLOps architecture. So that's sort of been recommended. So, okay. The name of the author is um, Chip Hewin. Yes. Designing machine learning systems. Just check it out on Riley. So yeah, thanks so much for, you know, joining us today, Tai. It's been a Thank really you. enjoyable conversation for me. And I hope it's the same for the listeners as well as the attendees uh, today. So where can people find your work and, you know, follow you online? Sorry, but I'm not on social media as of any type. <laughs> I am on LinkedIn. I'm not as active as... I think GitHub, maybe I really like having conversation about MLOps and infrastructure. I don't mind posting here my personal mail. And you guys feel free to just tackle me with anything that comes up to your mind. And I'll try to help as much as possible. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks again for sharing that. So... Thanks again for joining today's episode on building continuous ML pipelines with Jai. In our next episode, we're going to be chatting with Casper on building, uh, implementing vector search engines. So if you're really into vector search, into search engines and stuff like that, it's going to be a really, really uh, fun episode. So till next time, bye everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. MLOps Live is brought to you by Neptune AI. Remember that you can join us live at the next event and ask your questions. And you can register at neptune.ai slash events. And then make sure to search for MLOps Live in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere you get your podcast. Click follow and don't miss any episodes. Thanks and see you next time.